Good evening, everyone, to the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Thank you very much. Uh, chers amis, uh, dear friends, uh, welcome to the Night of Ideas. As you know, uh, French institutes organize every year hundreds of events all around the globe to have these great conversations between people of all walks of life, of all cultures. So uh, as we are here together with you, there are hundreds of similar events happening around across the globe. Uh, tonight's program is going to be very interesting. It's a, it's a real honor also to be here at the Aga Khan Museum uh, and have this conversation on a very important topic, which is rebuilding together. Uh, so whoever you are, wherever you're in Toronto, back in France or anywhere else across our precious, beautiful planet, I hope uh, you will enjoy this evening. Uh, this is my third night of ideas in Canada and, uh, and I find it very interesting that we wait for daylight to fade. Uh, we discuss with total strangers between twilight to midnight about very important topics that are close to us and uh, but total strangers and and that's that's the concept of the night of ideas how do you mix people and come out with great ideas to for the betterment of our planet so rebuilding together is all about how uh, as humans we have a responsibility to handle our relations with other living organisms around us um, as a previous person who worked uh, uh, during the COP21, uh, that's where the Paris Agreement was reached, as you know, I have a certain experience on climate change. And I, but I was sitting here in the same place a few months ago with Ulrike and Hadrian, and we were discussing about this particular event. A few thoughts came across uh, me, which I have noted down. I said, what mechanism is, it, is at play when we see that quite often Climate change deniers are the same who propagate fake news. <laughs> How could we explain that the same people who refuse to see the scientific truth on the state of our planet are the same who negate the ideas of equality and social justice? And how come the same people or entities who refuse the term burden sharing to help countries that face climate change, disasters, and rising ocean levels are the same who advocate closing the borders, or the same who breed uh, racial, cultural, or uh, communal disharmony. So I keep thinking about these questions, and I, the more I think, the more I think uh, I conclude that we did the right thing to partner with, with this institution that opens the world's eyes to what has been the artistic, intellectual, and scientific contribution of the Muslim civilization to the world. To be honest, I don't think that France and Toronto could have better institution to partner here this year because we all have a common mission of belonging to one human race, one planet, one world, and partake in the same quest of opening minds by opening our minds. Thank you, Ulrike, for having us here. Merci beaucoup. Bonne nuit des idées. And now I hand over the floor to Amir Ali, the head of performing arts of the Aga Khan Museum. Tonight, as has been mentioned, is interdisciplinary and cross-cultural. And we have the opportunity, particularly as a museum, as a center for the arts, to highlight that contribution. And if we are going to find solutions, you know, we should listen to artists as well. And so right now, uh, please, you know, stay, stay on and enjoy Tawhida Tanya Evanson, an Antiguan Quebecois artist, spoken word artist, novelist who is based in Montreal. And she's joined by Puria Purnazeri, who's Iranian, plays the tambour, incredible musician. We were supposed to do a live show and they recorded this performance for us just a few days ago. And we're very grateful to the Centre des Musiciens du Monde in Montreal for hosting that particular event. 
After Tanya's performance, we'll go into a panel that was recorded a couple of days ago here. Again, due to the, the current situation with the pandemic, we had to pivot from a live to an online experience. So please enjoy Tanya Evanson and stay, stay on after for the panel. Enjoy. here among you is in charge of human souls I desire to meet that one the one who unlocks the soul from its cage I desire to meet that one the lover made whole through sorrow and rage I desire the threshold keeper middleway walker axis of music and wine a creature from myth beside us hidden right here since time the rigorous drunk and sovereign both, a glance, a graze, a haze, a possessor of higher knowledge involved with every being in space. No laws in effect, in fact, full flaws in effect, in fact, the moon of every night, in fact, the sun, a secret living in plain sight. In fact, are you here because of me? I am here because of your light, planets reach for immortality. Involved with the pull of the sun. Lover, beloveds, through space and time, a star must be warm for someone. Desire, desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. Desire, desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. Desire, desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. And when your desire is my desire, when my desire yours. When your desire is my desire, when my desire yours. Should they crack the door just then, the room would be found empty. We are only mind. We create ideas. The bloodstream from beyond boils in us, breathlessly unveiled. <gasps> Breathlessly unveiled. <gasps> Breathlessly unveiled. <gasps> Until death, the union takes breath. <gasps> and I'm left. I'm left. I'm left. I'm Desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. Desire, desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. Desire, desires, desire itself. Desire, desires itself. And when your desire is my desire, when my desire yours, should they crack the door just then, the room would be found empty. We are only mind. We create ideas. The bloodstream from beyond boils in us, breathlessly unveiled. And so we listen, listen to know, know to do, do to progress, progress to arrive, arrive to find, find to lose, and lose yourself. Listen to know. And know to do and do to progress, progress to arrive, arrive to find, find to lose, lose yourself. And lose yourself to be found, let yourself be found by yourself. Find yourself to know, to know yourself. Know yourself to love and love to be loved. Then everything will become clear. Everything will become clear. Everything. Everything, everything will become clear.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tawhida Tanya Evanson. I'm a poet, author, and multidisciplinary artist, and I'm joined tonight by Puriya Purnazeri on tanbur, which is a Kurdish lute with 6,000 years of history behind it. Um, we thank also the Aga Khan Museum for inviting us to participate in the Night of Ideas, a night that looks at uh, the ability of human beings to live sustainably on planet Earth, which requires some psychological change, some spiritual awakening, and control, an ability to control our wild inner animal. Now on Earth, it is estimated that there are 10 quintillion insects. Some are endemic, native to a region, and others are invasive, 10 quintillion. Suckers don't bother, only hierarchy or tears. They infect us even in our sleep, set up websites in our dreams as we search for loopholes in their net. They say, you're rich in a poor country, so you're rich. You're poor in a rich country, you're probably rich. You're poor in a poor country, I still take your blood. us to go down, one by malarial one, taking action without heart. Is it past that no regard for what coin cannot buy? You can't take it away. You can't take it away. You take invasion path where you take no salary at all. This is our human duty. Come straight out the dead and fallen leaves, a forest of fine example forest fossils from here right up the interstellar. a beetle regenerator who take out and put back into the soil of which we are all citizen. Their balls of dung are more powerful than we will ever know, and they emerge fully formed from it. There's no world without animal. 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 Never mind the income they put in. Honey, pollen, silk, shellac, wax, gold, retail data, food and food. I mean, animal raised us inside and out. We took all that capital and spent it because our animal was hungry or angry. A dishonorable organism with all this stolen property. And for our children, for our children, is there anything but bankruptcy? Retirement, saving, pension? No crime will save us now. No enterprise, no amulet. What is coming may be far worse than any fraud or blood theft. So pray, take action with heart to survive hostile conditions. Be like the scarab from Kemet to roll the sun across the morning sky again and stimulate dead hearts back to life.
The best part of this, you, what you gave away. Your radiance, your flexible flowering, your spent concave back of cracked open posture. What you released from the chest outward, your exposed rib, your ultraviolet rays, your prayers on both sides of the day, your visible light. The best part of this you. What you gave away, your control, the fact that your current position, your power, your charity, 2.5% of your money, a small fortune, a great deal of food, furniture, books, clothing, opinion, and privilege. Everything you possessed, excised, eliminated, decolonized, sampled, copied, merchandised, given away. The best part of this you, what you gave away. All the vices, uploads, data bites, rejection letters, refusals of bull or product, all a dead giveaway for your surrender, your ultimate sacrifice, your very life, youth and verve, your womb and body, effort, time, semen and virginity. The best part of this you, what you gave away. All the listening, all the lessons, all the love and attention, your expertise and knowledge, your aura, your aurora, your empathy, your glow, your charm and energy, your magnetic electricity, your home fires, burning hospitality, bedrock kisses, and ultra-filtered blood. Quenched exhalations after love the hookups, the barebacks, the birthing of eight planets, dozens of dwarves, 218 moons, planetoids, asteroids, and comets. Without what the sun gave away, we would all drift off into space. Earth would freeze. No more warm milk from home. No more blood from Mars, Jupiter barely a breeze. No emails from Mercury, no doubles with Venus, Saturn unjeweled, Neptune dead quiet. And the beach on the ocean of liquid diamond at electric cyan, Uranus itself would be blood diamond free. The Big Bang is our oldest friend. We take advice from them. We know what we are, and we know where we came from. We know what we are, and we know where we came from. Thank you. My heart is the mud mosque at Jenne, beating for the universe itself. Every year the rains take it, and faith alone rebuilds it. My heart is the pyramids of Kush, and the entire complex of Giza, and Teotihuacan and the ziggurat of Ur. And my heart is a Himalaya, and the grandest gesture of canyons, and at Naika, a giant cave of crystal clear. And my heart is the very Uluru, the original dome of the rock, and Mecca at Hajj is just us dancing around our own soft black stone. The wailing wall says, lean in and kiss me. Lhasa is a mountain gym, and the Ganges say, get naked and swim. Out of all these centers on earth, 
visit my grave at Karnak and ask for Muat, the mother of truth and morality. And she will weigh your heart against a feather. Physiology flutter. Atrial fibrillation, brother. Repetition rhythms, extra beats. We all have it. On earth, as in us, the heart, the heart, the heart. Welcome everybody to the Night of Ideas, happening every year on the last Thursday of January since 2016. It promotes a cross-cultural dialogue about global issues of our time, each edition being focused on one guiding theme. Last year, debates were organized in, in almost 200 cities, spread over more than 100 countries. The organization of this worldwide event is supervised by the French Institute in Paris and the French Foreign Ministry, which coordinates the diverse local initiatives and grants them international exposure. This year, the Toronto edition is co-organized in partnership with the Aga Khan Museum and the Alliance Française de Toronto. Ulrike Alhamis, you are the head of the museum, and maybe you would like to say a few words about this partnership. Thank you very much, and a very warm welcome to our conversation tonight. Um, the Aga Khan Museum is devoted to bridging cultures through the art and fostering intercultural dialogue and pluralism, building positive uh, multicultural societies through greater understanding around arts and culture, and particularly with a focus on the um, Islamic arts, the arts of the Muslim world. Um, and we are really honored to be the host here in Toronto for this night and to be collaborating with our French colleagues around this extremely important and uh, wonderful initiative. Thank you, Ulrike. So our evening begins after the screening of the documentary Composer les Mondes, directed by Elisa Levy. I hope that you, our audience, were able to watch the film before our debate. In this documentary, the concept and ideas of Philippe Descola, a French anthropologist who has dedicated his life to shedding light on these issues, are confronted with a unique social experiment, that of Notre Dame des Landes in France, where the inhabitants deployed new ways of experiencing the world by opposing an airport project that was finally given up by the government. So tonight, deriving from uh, this year's main theme, Rebuilding Together, a World in Common, uh, our panel will focus on the question, how can we make our planet inhabitable again? So tonight, we would like to set up an interdisciplinary conversation about interspecies exchanges at the confluence of anthropology, ecology, narrative and artistic performances. The separation between human beings and their environment and their predatory relationship with the Earth has led to an ecological catastrophe which threatens the diversity of life. Faced with this reality, it is critical to rethink the relationships between humans and animals, plants, oceans. In the wake of recent anthropological, legal, and philosophical work on these issues, tonight's discussion will be an opportunity to think about this new diplomacy between humans and non-humans. So let me introduce now the, the panelists tonight. So we have film director Elisa Levy, who has just, <laughs> hello, <laughs> who has just released Composer les Mondes, and I think she is now working on a television series, series adapted from uh, Wajdi Mwawad uh, books 
anima. Uh, then we have Marine Calmet, a French lawyer who is advocating for the creation of a right to wilderness. And finally, Lisa Jens, anthropologist as at the University of Toronto, who focused her research on arid East Asia, Mongolia, and the Gobi Desert, and how animals there survive the Holocene. So let me ask a first question to, to start. Uh, let's talk about what interspecies diplomacy means to you. Or, to put it otherwise, how does the exploration of possible links, past and present, between human and the environment, between humans and non-human that we see in the movie, find their way into your work, legal or anthropological or philosophical or a way of life? Elisa, maybe you, you could start? Yes, I, um, I think for me it's the center of my work. So I think it's, um, it's the only way we can get out of this mess we are in now is to re rebuild different relationships with all the livings around us. And for me, it's the, it's the main, uh, main uh, it's, it's my main uh, resource for creating is um, to, to, um, to create bonds between interspecies bonds and to film them. So, because it's it's um, it's it, it hasn't been very explore ex, ex, it hasn't been very much exploration in this uh, for now. I think in movies, and I think cinema can have a can, cinema can because we can when you're making a movie, you can just take the place of the others. Uh, so it's it's I think we can experience uh, the way uh, the others are living. Uh, their different realities with with cinema so i think we, we i think cinema can change things also can you elaborate on that a little i mean the way you you film um, in composer les mondes the animals at night the trees and the people can you tell us how do you i, I think it's yeah, I think it's it's, it's uh, very important to film everybody as person, as you know, as people, uh, and not only human. Like to to uh, to explore, ex to to um, concentrate, to uh, film with my camera, like uh, a flower, a, a tree, everything, people. That's very important. Um, and this, what you're talking about, is the camera trap. I think the, the the camera trap can are very interesting because they can show us what's happening where when when we are not here. So I think it's it's very inter this this thing is very interesting. But also it can show us how we are sharing our the space and the territory with a lot of other beings and beings that and there are different different sounds and and different kind of things that we are with our human sense we are not able to. Um, to feel. So I think the, we can be in the eyes of the others with the camera. And that's, that's a way of, of feeling, uh, of sharing uh, feelings with them. So Marine, would you like to talk about what interspecies diplomacy means to you and your work? So as a lawyer, I have to say, I most of the time in uh, uh, listening modus. I listen to my clients uh, when it's uh, a, a human being and also if it's not a human being, so a non-human. If it's a river or a forest, I like to do the same work as if I would be working with a human being. So first in my career, I worked with indigenous people in French Guiana. I help them, I try to um, gain some uh, land back for them. So I listened first to their situation, to their culture, to the need they have to protect their identity. And in this work, I also learned a lot about how to listen to the forest, 
to the rivers of the French uh, Amazon. And that's now what I try to do, do the link between human needs and the needs of nature uh, with the law, the tools of law. And uh, for me, the movement for the rights of nature, that's exactly this, is uh, finding another way to bring some balance through laws uh, between humans and non-humans. So um, in the work of the, non, of the rights of nature movement, we really try to focus on what are the needs of nature, what's in the best interest of the river, uh, how could we represent as lawyers, but also as citizens, or uh, as a community, as an assembly, how would we recreate a new parliament? to represent the interest of nature. And then when I say nature, I talk about humans and non-humans together, finding solutions to build a new diplomacy, a new democracy together. So that's something I, for example, do on the Maroni River, which is the river that is between French, France and Suriname in, uh, in French Guiana. And uh, it's a river that is very polluted by illegal gold mining and we try to recreate an assembly for the river talking to represent also the interest the best interest of the river and also to create uh, their activities for humans that are in uh, balance with the interest of nature so that's a very um, complex problem we address there and it's also some uh, initiative that we found in other territories in France. I also work on the Rhone River, on the Esco, on the Loire River. There are a lot of initiatives in France that try through architects, uh, through lawyers, but also through um, people's students, for example, who definitely try their best to represent nature, to rebuild this uh, also link of trust between humans and non-humans and who tried to with different um, mobilization and diplomatical institutions uh, that we create because we have different in, uh, identities we create different assembly or uh, consultations uh, that brings us together we talk about the best way to represent nature in our society and to build a new model for guardianships uh, on our territories, on our rivers and our forests. And that's uh, with my law experience and expertise, I try my best to uh, help these initiatives and to uh, create a new um, or so harmony in France uh, for these territories and to respond to a real question how do we live on our territories, how we recreate this harmony with nature. Thank you, Marine. Um, Lisa, would you like to say a few words about this uh, interspecies diplomacy in your field and your research? Yeah, um, one of the things that I was reminded of uh, watching this film was Maxime Gorky's saying that transforming nature, in transforming nature, man transforms himself. And one of the things that this movie really highlighted for me was the urban and rural setting. And I think it's because I've moved so frequently in my life between rural and urban environments where in an urban environment, sort of the civilized world is really about control over land and property, about development. Um, and that really contrasts with the world of people living on the land outside of kind of capitalist demands on consumption and, and environmental de that, that forces environmental degradation. So, uh, and I think a lot of those sorts of um, tensions between worlds um, drives tensions between species. And my work and research really focuses on understanding how those two facets of society first evolved and understanding how our relationship with nature changed over time. And so that, that kind of idea of when did we start to, or we did when did we stop allowing 
the environment to transform us um, and begin to feel in that kind of way that's articulated and in Gorky's axiom that, you know, this kind of Promethean progress uh, is necessary and nature is our enemy. And so I think that in order to kind of create an interspecies diplomacy, um, we need to step back from this idea that we have to transform nature and we need to understand where that idea comes from and why it is that we feel we need to bend nature to our need. Um, and so I think for me in understanding how to move away from that kind of relationship with nature, we need to understand what drove that relationship with nature and why we ended up in the situation we are. Yeah, by the way, I, I was saying previously that you all, you still all use the word nature and it will take us some time to not use it anymore as Philippe Descola has tried to, to make us do, you know, because nature means uh, object, subject, relationship, whether when you use maybe earth could be okay, it means we are all together on earth. Um, Ulrike, you wanted to, to add something? Yeah, I mean, I, listening to you, am thinking there is a fundamental challenge that I would actually like to address in my second question to you all. Because um, when we talk about how we can improve relationships between ourselves as humanity and um, non-human life forms, if you like, on this planet, what strikes me is the fact that there is still a them and us approach, when really perhaps what we should be looking at is the reality, a physical as well as a spiritual reality for many, that uh, we are indeed interconnected and an integral organic part of the other life forms on this planet. So um, how do you see this when you think of the rebuilding between human and non-human life forms, um, thinking about re-establishing an awareness and um, a way of living that acknowledges that we are in fact not separate as a living manifestation, but organically, physically, and in many respects also spiritually interconnected with all the other life forms? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's very, very important. But I think a lot of people are, are very far from that. And, and, and so in, our each, in, in, each, uh, in each of our work, we, we can, I think that both three of us, we are working on this in, in three di different disciplines. But I think, yes, we, we need to show the, recon the, the connection again uh, and, and, and to, um, I think we can do it by, with, I think poetry can really help that, uh, help like people just get seat quietly and, and feel things inside them and feel that they are connected and that can share feelings with very different things and that they can see, maybe begin to see magical things around them. And I think art, of course, can, can help that. But I think in all the discipline, we need to, to try this. This is a very beautiful be point. And I'm so pleased you bring up poetry because um, in our museum, of course, we have a lot of artworks that uh, are visualizations of poetry or even literary or philosophic um, principles. And actually, when I was preparing for our conversation tonight, I looked at a few of the artworks in our museums, and I realized that many of them actually have very good uh, stories to tell us. I'm going back to the point that was also made about listening to nature, and I would add to that reading nature. And I would love to show you um, a little uh, example of that to illustrate how we can actually read nature and reflect upon um, physical metaphors that can inform our behavior and the way we interact with nature. 
This, is, this comes from a wonderful manuscript that we have in the collection from late 16th century Iran. It's called the Anwar Suheli, which means the lights of Canopus. Canopus, of course, being the brightest star in the southern hemisphere. And it's a collection of animal fables that were a Persian version of an earlier Arabic version that in turn was influenced by ancient Indian uh, animal fables mm -hmm. and that later made their way into Europe through Hebrew and Latin and uh, Old Spanish translations. But what I love about this particular story of the ducks and the tortoise, tortoise who you can see flying at the top of the picture is that they actually had to leave their natural habitat because a water hole that they were living around had dried up. So obviously, uh, an early in indication of climate change and climatic uh, modifications in the environment. And so these animals, the tortoise is worried that she will be left behind because she has nowhere to live anymore and she pleads with the ducks to please take her along and save her and take her to uh, a habitat where once again they can live together. So the ducks say, no problem, we can do that, but the condition is that you bite the stick that we will lift into the air and transport you with you must not say a word. You must stay silent throughout. So they put conditions on the rescue. And they, and they ask the tortoise, in a sense, to submit to their uh, rescue plan, which, they, which the tortoise thinks is a good idea. So off they fly. And as they fly along, the people that you can see at the bottom and the animals start mocking the tortoise and saying, what is this crazy tortoise flying along, on a, holding on to a stick uh, with these ducks? So the tortoise gets really annoyed because her decision is being questioned and she is being made out an idiot for holding on to the stick. So she opens her mouth to reply to the, uh, to the teases and to the shouts that she hears from below. And of course, she drops and um, that's the end of the story. So what I love about this is here we have one example of how um, nature has inspired a morale that is actually one for us to contemplate in our relationship, both with ourselves as part of this planet and with nature at large. So um, how do you see this contemplation of um, really seeing the environment around it, everything that our planet has to offer in terms of living forms as um, really a place where we should contemplate and um, seek metaphors for our own behavior and engagements. Perhaps, Elisa, to you again, um, being the filmmaker and looking at these uh, interspecies uh, dynamics? Yes, for me, silence, I mean, I mean the silence in terms of, of uh, the human silence is, 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 um, is one of the things I, I prefer when I film, when I take my camera. I just finished a movie in Camargue here. I'm in, I'm in Arles, and Camargue is a, a, a very wild uh, place uh, in France with a lot, a lot of birds. and, and and so, yes, it's, um, it's incredible when you get to have the chance to be far from human talking. It's, it's so, it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's, it's very uh, powerful. And, 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 and I think it's, um, it's there that, that you can just, um, I don't know how to, to explain this, but for me as an artist, I think it's what I, I try to highlight. It's the, the way things are talking, not with words, but I think if, if it's my main goal to, 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 uh, to share this uh, through my camera and, and, and give it back to people. So maybe when they get out of the movie, they can hear it also. 
Lisa, maybe you can talk also about uh, the story and the animals, because this is what you work on in Mongolia. Yeah, I think, um, I think the idea of silence is really profound. And when we think about being in silence and the silence of nature, um, I think these are ways that we can find inspiration to create our, our place in the world between ourselves and, and animals and uh, the rest of the earth. I think that when people in the past and, and people in the present as well, I think when people live close to nature um, and they have the time and the silence to sit in it and uh, to appreciate the earth, uh, the sky, the grass, the ground, and all of the animals around them, I think they naturally start to care for those things and to want to care for those things, but to care for those things on the terms of those species themselves. Um, and so few of us have access to the world um, in that way anymore. I think one of the things that really stood out for me in this film was the way that many of the people who were creating this community um, were living in, in, were sort of in the margins of urban society and found a new life and healing in the environment um, and in around animals and plants and other species. And I think that, um, I think that as a society, part of rebuilding is allowing that to happen for people and allowing a pathway by which people can um, have the freedom to step outside of kind of a capitalist system without penalizing them or, or marginalizing them. Um, because those are, those are the people who are able to hear other species uh, um, and to connect with them and gain knowledge and develop traditional knowledges uh, over generations. Um, so those were the sort of two themes that I, I picked up between those things. And uh, Marine, can you, I mean, I'm sure lots of people are asking you that question, but can you explain how do you speak about river or about mountains and not for them in, in you know, in, in the law? I mean, how can you, how can you have the rivers peak? <laughs> So first of all, I would say I have to listen to all the problems to understand the real problem about what's going on. Is it a pollution? Is it a destruction of the balance of the aquifer? Is it what, what is the problem and how does it came from? And after this, um, as a lawyer, it's also part of the job. I have to find solutions uh, to be adapted to the problem and uh, to lay on something that is not actual law because I don't use environmental law. I use rights of nature, which is a, compl a complex and different approach, uh, which is not related to human law, but related to the laws of nature. So for me, an important thing is uh, to take a lot of time to also talk a lot with the inhabitants of the regions who most of the time have also like the kind of stories you just told us about in this myth that is related to uh, deep and grounded knowledge about the earth and the environments that they live in these inhabitants of these territories most of the time have a lot of knowledge about all of this. So, for example, in French Guiana, before I uh, started to work, I took four months just to listen. I went from a village to another and I consulted all the local authorities, so the chiefs from the indigenous people, and I listened to the story of each village all the myths, all the stories that they told me um, to simply understand what's the problem, 
where is it coming from, what would be an appropriate solution in this kind of situation. And I do this uh, on all the ecosystems I work on, just to be capable to also fear, feel, sorry, feel the, 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 what is going on in this ecosystem. Is it possible that, for example, um, a, a, a river is violated in his integrity through a hydro a, a, a hydraulic dam, for example? Is it possible that uh, an island feel uh, feel lonely because the inhabitants are gone and nobody is caring about the ancient culture anymore? How is it possible to link, for example, human feelings also with feelings of animals? I am very interested in observing also animal um, capacity and feelings, um, intelligence, actually. What we see by, for example, I work on pig, pigs' intelligence. Um, it's very interesting to know, for example, that pigs are singing songs to their children and what is it saying about the structure the family structure the social structure of these animals um, for example elephants are uh, have uh, ceremonies for funerals but also for births and i'm very interested in this because it shows how near we could be to animals, plants, ecosystems, if we would just only listen and look and learn from what we have in front of our eyes, actually. And that's, for me, the most interesting thing in my work, that I just listen, observe, and try to propose laws or, or rules that are related to this kind of simple observations. Yeah, I'd like to go back to Lisa and, and to stay, um, I mean, to continue to talk about silence because I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. Lisa, as a, as a paleontologist, you, you make the stones speak. Stones are mute, but they speak to you. They speak with a lot of, con I mean, there's a lot of context that goes into them speaking. So um, <laughs> there's pieces of, pieces of society that are found in pieces of stone. And, and each, um, you know, if you want to be really literal about looking at stones, each piece of stone that someone has worked on has says something, how they've worked on it has said something about how they've collected the stone and, and um, how they visualize it and, and how they're adapting it to, to the needs that they have. Um, and I think in that instance, learning is more about being silent while I read. <laughs> <laughs> or and or being silent while I listen to um, the signs of, of the the ground and the the stone and and the the bones that are left. And also, what, what we have been saying reminds me of um, uh, Eduardo Cohn, the, the anthropologist, um, in his book uh, "When Forest Speaks." I think it is the title. There is a, a chapter uh, dealing with the interpretation of the dream of the dog by the human. And uh, I found it totally crazy in a way and, 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 and super interesting because it means first that dogs are dreaming, which we are not sure of, and their dream has a meaning, and then human, although of course you cannot really speak to the dog, they can interpret the dream. And I think what everybody is saying here, we are, we are like breaking the boundaries of perceptions. And the more we are able to 
you know, to circulate among all those silence, dreams, uh, spiritual um, artifact, I, I don't know, but the, I, I think all of you are trying to break the boundaries and this is the only way maybe to, to really inhabit this or, or make this planet inhabitable again. Elisa, you want to say something? No, it made me think about uh, uh, something in um, the book of Philippe Descola called Les Lances de Crépuscule. Have you read this one? And, and he is talking about the dream uh, that people have had, and they are dreaming about a, a stone. And <clears throat> they wake up and they tell this the, there's a story about this stone, and they go in the river and they just find the stone. Yeah, the, so it's for us, it's it's incredible. But I think, um, we, I mean, everything is, is is able to exist. I mean, it, it just depends on 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 which uh, on, on on which we we decide to uh, uh, we what she discola called an ontology. So the sign we decide to see when we when we are. Um, uh, all together as as, as human. Um, I don't know. It's not very clear because it's very difficult to explain in in in, uh, in English, and it's very diffi difficult to explain it in French also. But it's we are only able to see wha what we have been teaching to to um, <clears throat> to see, you know. So that I think is one of the the thing we can learn from Philippe Descola's work. But what we, are, we, are only, we can see only what we are being taught. Do you think that there's sometimes a danger in, um, in then using our own worldview to interpret the worldviews of the animals and, and the plants, if plants have worldviews, and interpreting those things as well? And I wonder if sometimes we don't um, think about, you know, the idea that d dogs are dreaming in the same way that we dream when in fact the way that we dream is interpreted by us within our own worldview. <laughs> so it becomes very complicated. Of course. <laughs> oh yes, of course, but in the same way it's the only things we have. So we uh, we have to try something, you know. <laughs> but I think that's a very, very important point because all of us are conditioned to see what we want to see, not what is. And how do we go beyond that? And it actually leads me to a question that I have to all of you um, from my perspective here working in the Aga Khan Museum. And, and that is really when you look for possible solutions um, to improve the relationship or the interdependency or the organic oneness of humanity on the one hand and non-living art forms on the other hand. How do you see the roles, be they philosophical, spiritual, um, educational, that other world cultures can play in finding solutions? Because one um, challenge is, as we just said, you know, we come at it from our own perspectives, our own experiences. But if we take the planet as a whole, there are a multitude of cultural experiences, not only in our day and age, but again, looking back, I just gave you a historical example, um, where if we were more humble in many ways in opening ourselves up to the possibilities that are out there to be informed by other uh, human cultures around the world, we might actually come closer to, um, to finding a really uh, viable solution. And you have in your case studies and your focus of work uh, brought up a couple of cultures that you are particularly interested in and are working with. But where do you see the potential of older world cultures, spiritualities, in informing all your endeavors around this topic? I think <clears throat> Adrien was saying it earlier, we are all using the word nature, but we are also using this word culture, not for only for culture, I think, that are made by humans, but culture as a society, as a group. And I think also that we have to 
just uh, think about what this term means, what this word means, because uh, I think um, <clears throat> there is no, I think there are different way of living, thousands, millions, maybe, and, and <clears throat> what I was saying earlier, like we only see what we are um, taught to, to see. I mean, in fact, it's what we are taught to watch. So I think all what you're talking about, all the culture, all those different <clears throat> way of living, way, way of interacting, of having relationship with others. I mean, others in a way of human, non-human, everything we, we want. Uh, I think this, this, uh, this is like something very <clears throat> relieving because it's, it shows us that we can recompose, I mean, in a lot of different ways. And, and so I think it's very interesting for that. Yeah, I, th I think some of the, the worst environmental devastation has come out of um, one culture moving into a different landscape and putting their own ideas about how an environment should be interacted with uh, onto that new landscape. Um, so I think in, in a very specific way, um, traditional knowledge and understanding and spirituality um, evolves over generations and millennia within a specific environment and place and time. And you can see that process in Eliza's film uh, beginning in a new way for, for different people. Um, but I think that one of the challenges that we're facing today and a challenge that people have faced very frequently in the past is environmental change where um, the environment becomes something very different than what it was. And we see this over and over and over again archaeologically where the climate changes massively and people um, have to adjust to those new environments. Um, and the culture that they have doesn't actually um, provide answers. And so a lot of times we see people drawing from other cultures to be able to adjust changes in society to changes in the earth um, and to changes in the species around them. And so I think having an understanding of diverse ways of doing things and the greater an understanding we have of diverse ways of doing things, um, both within a variety of world cultures today, but also the variety of world cultures in the past um, and the ways that people lived in the environment in the past or the way that people lived on the earth with the planet in the past are really critical to being able to, um, to adapt to the changes that the earth goes through. Um, not just the changes that the earth goes through naturally, but also the changes that we've forced the earth to be going through um, because of our, um, the way that we've interacted with the earth irresponsibly. I love, I love what you just said. And um, again, there is really um, a need also to recognize that um, we cannot go on just um, exploiting nature as a resource. Uh, you know, it is something that is of us. We are of it, as it were. And um, in order to do that, the systems that we are working within also have to be questioned and have to be made more uh, fit for purpose when it comes to um, you know, rescuing this, this planet of ours with all its beauty and its uh, diversity. And again, there is a wonderful metaphor I want to uh, uh, share with you where this where, where nature is used um, as a metaphor in art to think about how to influence um, the thought processes of rulers and of those in power. So I wanted to show um, another miniature we have, number two, which comes from another manuscript called the Akhlaq Nasari, and that means the ethics of uh, Nasser. And this uh, manuscript was uh, illustrate, written and illustrated in uh, what is now Pakistan, Lahore, in the late 16th century. And what you can see in this miniature painting, which I love, is basically a flooding river. It's been uh, raining really, really heavily. 
the river is, is very wild and um, overflowing. And there are three men trying to struggle through this river and struggling to get to land and to survive. But what you see is actually not um, a physical depiction of a natural phenomenon per se. It is a visualized metaphor for how you should deal with the torrents of the mind of a ruler. And the story that um, is, the wisdom that is in this story is that if you throw yourself into um, thoughtless opposition to the torrent of this ruler's mind and, and the way he thinks, you will not be able to uh, survive, you will not be able to succeed. So the, the story says you need to navigate, you need to mitigate, you need to um, really feel yourself into how this mind works and surrender to the currents of that mind and try to flow with it and thereby come to your resolution, to your um, changing the person's mind or, or overcoming the person's mind. So what I love about this miniature painting is that here again, something that physically happens within our environment is actually taken to make us reflect how can we overcome the status quo? How can we uh, feel ourselves so much into our challenges that we uh, end up not mitigating them, not only navigating them, but actually coming to a successful solution at the end? So um, that is something that also always fascinates me because ultimately nothing will change in our relationship to the non-human living forms on this planet if we don't also go back and question some of our traditional structures in, in, um, in the way that we have been doing things as communities, societies, uh, political uh, structures, and so on. So I wanted to say we often hear uh uh, adults say today the, it's our children who have become aware of the climate crisis and they are the ones who will decide the issue and who will solve the problem ahead of us, which by the way looks like a resignation of sorts. And they are the same adults who, with a post-war lifestyle and combined with devastating neoliberal capitalism, led to the disaster we are now experiencing. And it seems to me that each of you in your discipline has decided to act, uh, that you are committed activist. And through art or through law or through a, a way of life in opposition to the, to the system, predatory system, you managed to deal with the issue. And then my question is this, how did you come to this decision to act rather than leaving it to others and to your younger generation to take care of the planet? <clears throat> um, it's a very difficult question. I, I don't know. I think it's, you just cannot go on with the reality. I mean, and, and <clears throat> I don't know, it's, it's um, do you have, Marine, do you have a, an answer? <laughs> Um, in, in my personal life, I, I can't agree actually with the question because um, I'm a mother. I just have a, I have a son. He's one year old. And actually he's the, also the reason why I, I don't have the option just to step back and wait <laughs> and look what will happen. I don't have this, even I, uh, I, I can't imagine doing so because it makes no sense for me it's uh i'm i'm very scared about what could happen if uh i would simply let go and think someone else would do the job in my way I, it's also my responsibility for my child to protect him from what will happen so there is no option for me and um I also got very inspired from my own father, so I'm transmitting 
uh, this to my child because my father is a biologist. He always educated me to take care of nature, to respect nature, to look at it with without touching it. <laughs> and um, I think there is no way an adult can say it's the job of our children to fix this problem. It's our responsibility. It's the one from our, from all the members of our community actually to act. And there is nobody that can say it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. So for me, um, there, this, this question is very simple to solve because uh, I, I'm very committed and my son is actually also one more, one reason more why I try so hard to change things because I want to protect him and I want that he has a better future than the perspective we now, now have about future. I think it's very similar for me. Um, knowing and acting on my beliefs um, has actually always come really naturally to me. Um, critically important. Uh, and despite a lot of the negative responses that, that it can often entail. Um, and again, as with Marion, it's an example that I learned from my parents. Um, my parents grew up in urban Vancouver um, and decided to go back to the land and become subsistence farmers. And they raised us um, with very little, actually, most of what we had was grown by, was grown and made by ourselves. Um, and I think that children, most of all, need an example. Um, humans are just these really deeply social animals and our brains are such that they're capable of being imprinted to follow pretty much any diversity of social structures. Um, and I think if we don't provide a foundation that we believe to be really solid, um, who's going to provide that foundation for them? Uh, I don't trust society to help my kids figure out how to move forward <laughs> and fix the world. Um, and I think, you know, when we expect, uh, the problem is that not only are we expecting children to move forward and change the world, which is an incredibly huge responsibility, but I think we simultaneously, as we're doing that, are trapping them in kind of a, our own toxic world of addictions, um, our addictions to toys, to luxury, to power. And I think when we do this, we strip children of their ability to act. Um, and I think we need to show them, as my parents did, and as Marine's father did, um, how we can act, how it's okay to let go of those things. Um, how we can loosen our our desire to control everything and still be okay and how we can teach them the importance of, of other species that we live with and of the planet um, and then if we give them that solid foundation i really believe that that they can find ways to act um, as marine is doing because of the example her father set i think each generation can get better but they can only get better when we create a foundation of health for them to grow and, and to create their own future on. Yeah, I, I think I can answer something now because <laughs> thank you, I, had, I needed time to say, but I think you're both absolutely right and I have kids too. But I think for me, it's, 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 it's even before as a kid that I think we, you can feel when you're a kid that there is something um, that's wrong with the relationship with, with the others, that with the other human, the other animals, and that you, you feel that something is really wrong and, and you don't know, you're not able to, to tell what it is. And that's what striked me into Philippe Descola's work because it was like, okay, now I just can, I just can understand, understand what was wrong all these years when I was asking me like, okay, it can be different, but how how come and when did it start and and so uh, uh, yes i think uh philippe, philippe descola's work um i, I mean I, I was really uh, aware of everything before but it helped me to find a way to really be efficient in my in my engagement i think 
Yeah, I, I would say from my perspective, um, you know, in a sense, what you are doing through your specific uh, professional trajectories, I and, and our museum here are doing through the arts because our mandate is unique in the fact that we um, are called upon to use our collection, our exhibitions, performing arts programs, and so on as tools for positive social change and positive uh, contributions to life as we know it uh, at large. And what to me is so fascinating and what I was trying to show a little bit in our conversation today is that um, there are so, na so many narratives around artworks, mm, past and present, that um, can allow us to reflect on issues that are really existential and essential to all of us and to all of our uh, beings uh, in, in, on, on this planet today. And I find that really fascinating because it is something that um, most people haven't actually realized yet. And I would actually like to finish with one other uh, miniature painting in our collection, which actually always, um, to me, sums up where somehow perhaps one day we started off at and where perhaps one day we will um, end up again if, if we think about it right and if we analyze and um, learn and, and become more humble. This miniature painting is called The Court of Gaiomas. It comes out of a very famous um, manuscript that was made for an Iranian Shah in the early 16th century. And it shows the leader who was uh, inaugurated at the beginning of time. And he is, um, again, a visualization of an ideal of leadership. And he resides over a universe or um, yeah, existence, let's say, as we know it. So incorporating human, non-human elements, flora, fauna, and indeed, if you were to look at it closer, uh, spirits in the rock formations that have that live together in an Arcadian utopia in harmony, in peace, in respect, and in love, in, in love to, for each other. And um, something, however, is already lurking in this, um, in this miniature painting, because the ruler's son is being warned by an angel that evil is lurking and wants to destroy this Arcadian harmony between all the living forms. So this is a meditation piece, which again really is um, a visualization of enormously sophisticated spiritual, philosophical um, convictions and contemplations at the time that still has a lot of ideas and, and triggers for thought from which we can uh, take our own contemplations into the living world um, to, to today. And I think the key is, as I said before, that we need to recover some realization of the fact that it is actually only an us that will make this planet survive. It's not a them and us whether that's between us and other cultures, whether that is between us as humans and non-humans. It is a, a vision of the us that will ultimately drive us forward. And for that, we need to surrender to the fact that there are many, many different solutions that are out there that we need to recover, that we need to consult with, and that we need to contemplate in a complete spirit of equality and equity. Thank you. I, I, um, as a writer, also, I like to say a, a thing, and, and I like to come back to what Elisa said about Descola. For me, too, he, he was really, I mean, reading Descola was really very important for me in the way, as I said before, he changed my perception of, of everything, and he, and, and, he, and he changed the limit of perception. And, um, and as a writer, I use language, and, and to speak is violent, to write is violent, to and so the, the way it changed thing is, and, and you, you also said it, Ulrike, um, I think 
um, I, I'm trying now to write without domination, which is very complicated because the, once you use the word, you are dominating in a way. You are, you are transforming the, your, your topic in an, into an object. So how to be humble by writing, how to not use the language of domination, how, how to, to talk about the violence of the world without being violent with your own words. This is what I would try to, to do. Yeah, I think it's the main goal. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's um, how to, to tell things without um, making them happen. I mean, not, not, I don't know if it's very clear in English, but yes, I think uh, talk about violent, violence without showing violence or provocating violence is, is, is one of the main subjects we need to, to think about now. Well, with that, dear listeners, uh, we must conclude our discussions. And uh, I think you will agree with me um, when I said that we have uh, been fortunate to have those very diverse point of view tonight. We have been left with quite a bit of material to reflect. And I'd like to thank uh, our panelists, Elisa Levy, Femme Director, thank you so much. Marine Calme, uh, thank you so much and uh, Lisa Jens also, and of course, Ulrike Aramis for having us tonight, to, for hosting us. And um, the, the evening is not over yet, because in a few minutes we will return for the performance of Radha Shada. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, stay with us. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, a lot of work, not just on screen. Thank you, Adrian. And um, thank you, Rika, all the panelists, the Consul General, and Tanya Evanson, Puria Purnazeri. Right now, we're... Uh, actually, I wanted to thank all the crew, Felicity, Al Nasir, Marin, Stefan in Montreal, Kia, all the people who made this possible to happen online. Uh, as, as you know, we had planned to have it as a live event. So thank you, everyone. I want to thank the Alliance Francaise. I want to thank the um, uh, Embassy of, uh, of France in, uh, to Canada uh, for making this event possible, this uh, night of ideas. We end tonight uh, with a work by Radha Chada, an artist uh, that exemplifies the interdisciplinarity of tonight's event. She is not only an artist, she is also a microbiologist, and she brings together art and science in her very special work. Please enjoy, enjoy your night of ideas. I hope this provokes a lot of interesting thought for you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to take part in the Night of Ideas. Thank you to the Aga Khan Museum, the Consulate General of France, and the French Institute for inviting me. I've been asked to speak to you tonight about a new piece of work called IAM. And tonight you will see the first part in this four-part series called Dance of the Molecules. IAM, from the Latin for now, takes place at sequentially larger scales of material reality. The first act begins in the molecular, then we go through the human realm, the earthly realm, and final, finally the fourth act uh, takes place in the universal realm. So this is uh, an immersive performance installation, but we decided to film each act as we developed it in order to bring it to people during the pandemic. So as a whole, IAM is about the interconnectedness of nature and the fallacy that humans can live outside of it or control it. The pandemic reminds us that we are just a thread in an interwoven fabric of nature, a small part of a much larger evolutionary narrative. In the context of our changing environment, we must examine our perceptions as the driving force behind our behaviors, I believe. How can we break down ideas of separateness and superiority that underlie our parasitic relationship to this earth? How to reframe the us and them kind of thinking that divides us from the natural wor world and, and from one another? Perhaps a deeper consideration of what we're made of 
uh, the fundamental sameness of all matter and its interaction could help to wipe the illusion from our eyes. In Dance of the Molecules, Ali Blumas and Lee Galbloom perform barefoot on grass in a 3D immersive light environment created by projection onto surrounding trees. The first act tells the story of, the hu of human and viral enmeshment in the molecular realm. The dancers play molecules, and I used actual 3D molecules of these characters to create our stage. The coronavirus performs cloaked as a whole uh, organism and uncloaked as a single-stranded RNA. ACE2 is a human molecule that brings the virus into our cells, and it wears an asymmetrical but complementary costume which symbolizes their fate to bond. The ribosome, another human molecule, is massive and it, once inside the cell, it wraps around this single-stranded RNA to multiply it. In reality, this dance happens among molecules who are compelled by forces of attraction, as we humans are. When they fit together perfectly, a cascade of events is triggered. And there is a real astonishing beauty in in the molecular realm that exists in contrast to the fear and suffering that we're experiencing in the human realm. Yet this molecular materiality is what we are and we cannot live separate from it or from the fabric of nature. The Aga Khan Museum is presenting online exhibitions to support each film of each act as they are developed and we look forward to bringing you the second act of Body and Mind in March. And ultimately, uh, we're super excited to be bringing you the entire piece live uh, as a performance installation in 2023. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy Dance of the Molecules. Thank <laughs> you. 